Hello, I'm Jason with scienceandmath.com, and today we're going to do a really neat experiment. We're going to learn how to make a cloud uh, inside of a two liter bottle of soda. Now, all you're going to need for this experiment is some rubbing alcohol. This is regular old rubbing alcohol. Uh, some duct tape, you'll just need a little bit of it. You'll need an empty two liter bottle of soda that you've washed out and cleaned out. And you need some kind of bicycle pump. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to open our two liter bottle of soda and we're going to pour just a little bit of the alcohol inside. Now, how much doesn't really matter, but probably a couple teaspoons. And what I like to do is kind of close off the top after we've got the alcohol in there and just sort of rotate it around like this. So what I'm going to do to help me force air in there is I'm going to use a little bit of duct tape. So what we're going to do is just take our duct tape, for my, for my particular pump anyway, and I'm just going to sort of go around here and obviously we've covered it, so we want to be able to get the air in there. So I want to put a hole right in the middle. All right, so now we have duct tape there that's going to hopefully help us seal this container. And then we have a bicycle pump. And then what we're going to do is basically hold it. I'm going to hold it there with my hands while I force air and while I uh, manually pump it up. And then when we release the pressure, when I move my hand away, the air pressure inside that we've pushed in there is going to quickly escape through this hole. When you let go is when you'll see the cloud form. So here we go. I'm going to start pumping. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, one, two, three, let go. What you're seeing here is the water vapor inside the air that was inside of this bottle quickly condense into basically a cloud. That's what clouds are. They are water vapor that have come together and formed these masses that we can see in the sky. And they've condensed basically into little droplets that then form together. And today we're gonna to do a really incredible experiment where you're actually going to be able to counteract the force of gravity or defy the force of gravity. You need to get yourself a copper pipe. You'll also need a magnet. Any kind of magnet will work. This particular kind of magnet is called a rare earth magnet or a neodymium magnet, the stronger the magnet, the better this is going to work. Now before we get started, I just want to show you really quickly how strong this magnet is. This is a, a pair of pliers here. Whenever I attract it to the pliers here, you can see that it's attracted there here. When I grab it and try to pull it off, this magnet's quite strong. And that's because of the special way that these magnets are made. Now the interesting thing here is, Copper is not magnetic. Copper does not react to magnets. So this magnet, as strong as it is, you can see there's no trickery going on here. This magnet just falls right off. Now you could see a minute ago how strong it was when we attracted it to the pliers over there. It's a different metal. So what we're going to do is just cut right to the chase. As you can see, this is a hollow uh, tube. There's nothing inside of it. There's no trickery here. It's just a solid copper pipe. Now, before we get started, I'm going to show you, here's a copper penny. It goes right down and it pops out the other side. And we'll do it one more time just to show you. It goes right down there, maybe one second or so. We'll go right one more time, maybe one second or so. Here's our magnet, but we already said this is not magnetic at all, right? Now let's see what happens when we drop a magnet inside. And listen, watch carefully. Look at that. That took a few more seconds, didn't it? Let's count as we do it. Here we go. One, two, three, four. About four seconds. One more time. Here we go. One, two, three, four. About four seconds. Now to bring this home even more, I have another one of these magnets. It's identical. You can see I have two of these guys here. In fact, there they go. They attract together. They're the same magnet, right? Same size, same everything. So what we're going to do is lift them off the table. And on the count of three, we're going to see which one hits first. One, two, three. And you can see that the guy coming through the plastic tube falls straight through. The guy going through the copper tube 
takes a lot longer. We'll do it one more time on the count of three. One, two, three. Well, when you start studying electricity and magnetism, you're going to find out that magnetism and electricity are really, really closely related. In fact, you can use magnets to generate electricity. And that's exactly how power plants work. The bottom line is, if you have a magnetic field, which is what is invisible and it's surrounding this really powerful magnet, it's going through my fingers right now, it's called a magnetic field. If you take a magnetic field and run it across a piece of copper, if you move it across a piece of copper, then what you're going to get is electric currents generated in that copper. And that's how our generators work. But the, th the same thing is happening here. So as the copper, uh, as the magnet is falling, gravity's pulling it down, the magnetic field is moving through the copper and it's sliding across the copper. That motion generates electric currents inside this copper pipe. They just kind of circulate around as the magnet is falling. Fact number two, which is separate, is that any time you have an electric current flowing in anything, that electric current also produces its own magnetic field, right? So what you have here is a two-stage process. When we drop the magnet in, you have electric currents gener generated in this pipe, right? That's, that's part number one. The second part is those little bitty tiny electric currents are generating their own little tiny magnetic field. And here's the punchline. The tiny little magnetic field generated by the little tiny currents in there are repelling this magnet that's falling and trying to prevent it from, from going any faster. They're basically trying to slow it down. Today we're going to use food coloring, water, and a candle to show how air pressure can actually force water up a column. Uh, all you'll need for this guy is very simple things that you'll find from around the house. You'll need a plate, uh, you'll need a candle, and you'll need some food coloring. It doesn't really matter what color food coloring you have, but I chose blue in this case. And then what we're going to do is pour some water into this plate. Now, how much water do you need? You really don't need a lot of water, but you want to go ahead and fill it up where you have a fair amount of water, something like this. All right. And then what you want to do is put this candle right inside like this, light this candle. There we go. Let's let it go ahead and get nice and hot while the air is getting hot and while this candle is starting to, to work, work itself out is we want to make this water colorful. The only reason we're doing this is so that we can see the water as it rises up into the glass. So what we're going to do is just put a nice bit of food coloring, probably too much food coloring, but we like food, food coloring, so that's okay. And just give it a nice gentle stir. All right, so the next thing we're going to do is take our empty glass, which is the one that we have right here that fits over the candle. We're going to turn it over on top of the candle and push it all the way so that it's sitting inside this water. And I want you to look very, very carefully at the level of the water inside of this glass as this happens, okay? On the count of three. One, two, and three. Now let's watch carefully. So the candle is going. And the candle is using the oxygen inside of this guy here. It's heating up the air. And then eventually, because of the uh, seal there, the oxygen is all being used up. And then what happens here, look what happens here. As the candle goes out, the water level is rising, rising, rising uh, inside of that cup. And you can see the water level rose probably maybe one and a half centimeter, something like that. Uh, there. So this is a demonstration, again, in air pressure. I can go ahead and take my safety uh, glasses off now that we've actually done the experiment. Um, what's happening here is whenever we light the candle, we said more than once that it's heating the air up, right? And we already talked about in other experiments, when you heat things up like air, they want to expand, they want to get bigger, right? So the air that's sort of in this pocket around the uh, around the candle, it's wanting to expand, it's wanting to get bigger, it's wanting to push away, right? And so when we cap off the top of it with the cup, we exhaust the, the oxygen supply. The candle can't burn anymore because there's no more oxygen inside. So slowly the candle flame goes out, right? Now as soon as the candle flame goes out, there's no more heat being produced inside of this guy. So the air that was left behind, you know, the air tried to push its way away from the candle. Whatever air was left behind immediately starts to cool off. 
right? What happens to gases when they start to cool off? They start to get smaller, they start to contract, right? When things contract, we say they have lower pressure. When things expand, we say they have higher pressure. So what really happened here is we made the air hot so that when we capped it off and cooled, cooled off the, the air that was left behind, it starts to contract and the pressure inside of this glass gets lower because of that. So what we have at the end of the day, once the candle goes out, is we have a low pressure inside of this glass, and where's the other pressure at in, in this situation? We have higher pressure outside the glass because of the atmosphere. We don't feel that pressure, but it's always there. So we have so much pressure pushing on the water all around this glass, it's pushing down, that's atmospheric pressure. And then inside, we created a situation where we have low pressure. So we have a low pressure inside, which means low pushing, high pressure outside, which means higher pushing. So the outside air pressure pushes the water level down, up into the glass. It goes down around the bottom lip of the, of the glass and goes up. And today we're going to build a very simple electric motor that you can build really out of three components. All you'll need to build this little guy is a AA battery. Go and get a new battery. Uh, you'll need some copper wire. This is solid copper wire. There's no insulation on it. It's just sort of bare copper. And you will need a magnet. This is a rare earth magnet. So go ahead and make a quick cut. And then we will just sort of put this off to the side. We don't need that anymore. And basically what you're going to do is you'll just take your battery and your magnet and you will stick the magnet to the bottom of the battery like that. So that's not, not going anywhere. And ultimately what the entire device will consist of is you'll put it on the desk and let it sit there and this piece of copper that we're about to make is just gonna spin around and around and around until the battery goes dead. Is take your long strand of wire and basically you want to fold it in half. So you take it like this and by the way there's no hard and fast science to this. I mean, as far as how to build it. There's science as far as how the motor works, but there's no one way to, to exactly do it, I guess is what I'm trying to say. You'll see very quickly how we're basically building the thing, but as far as like the exact way you fold it, the exact way you shape it, the exact way that you, you form the thing, uh, doesn't really matter that much. So what you're, what you're trying to do is basically make a little point here, and then once you get it into a point like this, you want to sort of make almost like a golden arches out of it, like this. So we're gonna turn it upside down, and we're gonna bend it like this. Or you could look at it as a bird, you know, a little flapping bird, whatever you wanna do. But basically, you want it to be in a little point like that, and kinda of coming up with sort of like a golden arches. Now, the reason we're doing that is because really what you wanna do is you want it to balance on top of this battery, the way we have it here. Uh, we'll have it basically like this. Now what we want to do is we want to sort of mark where the magnet is at the bottom. So if we sort of put it there, the magnet is going to be there. So keep your finger there. And what you want to do is sort of bend that in like this. Right? You want to bend that in. You want to do the same thing on the other side. And you can sort of see what I'm talking about where when I say there's no exact science to, to exactly how to build these things. You know, it's going to be your own little creation when you're done with it. Right, so if we put it like this, we should have these two little pieces crisscrossing right on top of the magnet. Basically, you're making a circuit where the electricity can flow out of the battery and down through the magnet. And of course, since the magnet's connected to the other part of the battery, it just kind of makes a circuit of electricity like this. Okay, so what we want to do is as we place this guy on top like this, we want to be able to touch the top and have the bottom two pieces touch the magnet down here. And we'll let go. And you can see it already sort of started to spin. So you can sort of let go and you can see it spin and it sort of falls off. So this is the basic motor. You can sort of see it spinning as we do our thing. The only problem is it's really not stable because since the bottom here is sort of open, as soon as it starts spinning, a lot of times it's gonna fall off and that's no fun. So what you really wanna do is sort of bend the bottom here. If you can kinda of see, uh, if you can kinda of see down by the magnet, what you really wanna do is bend these bottom pieces to kinda of curve around your magnet and sort of grab onto it. And that can take a few minutes to do. So I've already done it basically right here 
and you can sort of see the difference. So here's the one I just created here. You want to kind of curve these two pieces down here. And so that's what I've done in this one right here. You can sort of see this guy curve down like that. So if you do that, then what you're going to have is you'll just kind of, you can see how it's kind of loosey goosey down here. You can just kind of go and slide it on top and touch it there and let go and see what happens here. And we can see that it is spinning nicely and it just sort of continues to go and go and go. And that's the nice thing about this motor. It's very simple to build, just takes a few minutes. And you can literally have this sitting out on your desk. If you're a teacher, just kind of have it sitting out. If you're just working in an office environment, just grab it out of your desk, put it out. And this thing's gonna continue to spin until the battery's dead. So what you have here is, is very simply a wire connected to the top of the battery, the positive terminal of this battery. And then you have that wire coming around and taking the electric current down and dumping it into this magnet. And now you need to know also that this magnet conducts electricity. So when the electricity goes into this magnet, it's allowed to go straight back up into the battery. So you've com com completed a circuit on both sides really, and you've allowed the electricity to kind of come out and back and come back down into the magnet. Now, what this does is very, very uh, important is really the key to the whole thing working. The one thing you need to know to know how any magnet uh, or any motor works, any kind of motor that turns when you put electricity into it, they all basically work the same way. Uh, motors work because of one fact of nature, and that is the following. If you have a magnetic field, and we have a magnetic field around this magnet here, if you have a magnetic field, then if you have an electric current flowing through a wire in that magnetic field, then there's going to be a force on that wire. Right? Now in this particular case, the direction of the magnetic field, that's all invisible by the way, you can't see the magnetic field, but it's here. Um, the direction of the field and the direction of the current line up in such a way to cause a force to want to push this guy, which direction? In the clockwise direction. So the current is flowing down through and going in this direction, the magnetic field is, is down there around that magnet, and the di two directions of the magnetic field and of the current tend to put a force on this side of the wire, pushing this way, and on this side of the wire, pushing this way. So what you get is a net turning effect. So the force on this wire is going that way, the force on this wire is going that way. And uh, in this experiment, we're going to start to work with dry ice. Uh, and we're going to use it to create dry ice bubbles. What you will need for this experiment is some dry ice, which is, just so you know, frozen carbon dioxide. You'll need some duct tape. You will need some clear plastic tubing, and you'll see what that's for in a little bit. You'll need some kind of fitting that you can plug into this plastic tubing, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. You'll need a two liter bottle, just an empty two liter bottle. Uh, you will need uh, Dawn dish soap or some kind of dish, dish detergent because we are going to be blowing bubbles. And you'll need some kind of tongs to, to help us out uh, with this experiment. Now this stuff is carbon dioxide. So that's the gas that you breathe out whenever you exhale, carbon dioxide. If you take carbon dioxide and put it in a super cold freezer, eventually it will cool down and it will become solid like these guys right here. So these guys are solid chunks of look like little ice cubes, but they're actually frozen gas. Regular ice is zero degrees Celsius, right? This is negative 78 degrees Celsius. So if this is where ice is at zero Celsius in your regular old freezer, you have to take carbon dioxide 78 degrees lower than that in order for it to freeze. So the reason it's dangerous, so to speak, is not because it's poisonous, it's just because it's so cold. Now the other thing that makes it different than regular ice is that this stuff doesn't exist as a liquid carbon dioxide. See, with water, it's ice cube, liquid water, gas, which is water vapor, right? And you can go solid liquid gas. With this stuff, it doesn't exist as a liquid at the pressure that we live at here on Earth. So when you melt uh, uh, dry ice, it doesn't go to liquid, it goes straight from solid to gas, straight from solid ice cube or solid frozen carbon dioxide cube, dry ice cube, to gas carbon dioxide. And so it doesn't go through liquid. And that, that has a special word in science, it's called sublimation. So it's a little different than a regular ice cube, it's just the way it behaves, it goes straight to gas. And what we're gonna do is just take one of these regular size cubes here and drop it in the water and see what happens. Let me actually switch this guy around here. 
put this guy right over here and we'll put this guy right here. So let's grab one of the medium sized cubes, drop it in there. And you can see that what happens immediately whenever you put it into water is it starts making this fog looking stuff. It starts making this Halloween looking stuff. So what's happening here is we're putting this very cold dry ice directly into a warm liquid because I, I have warm water here. And so what's happening is the solid carbon dioxide is going straight from solid straight to gas. It's melting basically. Just like if you take an ice cube and you put it in water, it melts. But ice goes from solid through liquid, and then if you heat it up some more, it goes to gas. Dry ice doesn't go to liquid. It goes straight from solid to gas. So that's why we see all the gas here. Now, if you kind of put your swirl your fingers around the gas, it feels a little bit cool. That's because the stuff is really cold. The dry ice uh, is actually very cold in there. And what you're, you're seeing here is carbon dioxide. Now, I want to make sure you understand, the fog you see, the white, puffy, smoke-looking stuff, that's not the carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is invisible. I mean, think about it. You breathe it, right? So when you blow out, when you breathe, you breathe in, you blow out again, you don't see the carbon dioxide. That's invisible. But the carbon dioxide, when it comes off of, of, of the uh, dry ice cube, is so cold that that cold carbon dioxide gas is condensing the water in the air. And that's the cloud you see. So the visible stuff, the cloud looking stuff, that's water vapor that's condensing, that's in the air. The Carbon dioxide itself is, is, very, is very much odorless and, and invisible, and you can't see that. So you're seeing a mixture of the two here. All right, so the next thing we want to do is go ahead and make our soapy mixture. This is what we're going to blow bubbles with. So we'll take our dish soap, and we'll just put sort of a healthy amount down on the bottom. And then what we'll do is we'll take some of our water, and we'll just sort of make, just like you would blow bubbles, you know, with a bubble wand, we'll make like a little solution of that and see if we can get that to make bubbles. So what we'll do is we'll just use our little finger, here to stir this up. There's nothing dangerous here. It's just water mixed with dish soap. Now to go ahead and test it, all you do is stick it in the end there, kind of wiggle it around, and blow a bubble. And we can see that we're making bubbles, so we're doing good. What we're going to do is we're going to drop our dry ice in here, and so we need some water. So let's go ahead and put this water in here. Now this is warm water. It's not super hot. You don't want it to be super hot. You want it to be nice and warm. And you want to fill it up about halfway or maybe a little bit more. So this is about where we want it. We want water that's nice warm water, not too hot, not too cold, in about three quarters, two thirds of the way up this bottle. This guy's going to go in here and we're going to tape it in place. But before we actually do that, we want to get the dry ice in there and ready. So we're going to have that set aside. We're going to put the dry ice right over here. And now we're almost ready to go. We have our dry ice, we have our bottle, we have our, our bubble solution here. And drop one in there. So we'll just kind of go one at a time. You can see some are easy to fit and some aren't. So I'm just going to drop a few in there until we have enough where I think we can actually start blowing some bubbles. Okay, so we have three or four bubbles of dry ice, uh, blocks of dry ice in there. You can see that they're rapidly uh, releasing carbon dioxide, which is coming out. It's hitting the water vapor in the top of this guy and condensing it. That's the cloud you see. And now we're ready to actually start to try to do this, guy. So let's take our tube. We'll just put our tube uh, in there and we'll just take some duct tape and just make a nice little seal to force the majority of this gas. And you can see we have our little uh, gas coming out there. We're going to put it in there and start to blow some bubbles. And there is a dry ice bubble. We'll bounce it off and it popped there. Let's see how big they can get. Let's just kind of hold it there and just see when it's ready to let go. And I'm going to try to let it drop down into the little soap that's dripping down above here and see if it'll detach. Almost. But you can see these bubbles are full of this uh, this mix this carbon dioxide gas with water vapor. There we go. So we want to tilt it to the side a little bit, and we can get get them to detach and kind of land on our towel a little bit. All right. And whenever you're done looking at them, you can just touch them. Poof, and there it goes. Let's see if we can get one to stay. When you're done looking at them, you can just pop them. One, two. So it's a lot of fun. 
And now we're going to have a grand finale for these blowing of these carbon dioxide bubbles, or these dry ice bubbles. So before we had sort of the little bubble wand blowing small bubbles, now we have a large bowl with warm water inside and a lot more dry ice. And what we're going to do is try to, to blow a bubble with the entire bowl. So here are some large pieces of dry ice. Notice what happens when I put them in, lots and lots of action. So we'll put that in there. We'll put some more, immediately starts to bubble. Put some big chunks in there. Something like that. All right, now I have a piece of a rag that I've cut here. And what we're gonna do is sort of put that into our bubble solution. And what we wanna do first is we want to kind of get some nice bubble solution right along the edge, along the lip. We wanna hold our rag out kind of flat. This is a little bit messy here. I promise it's worth it. And we'll just go around the edges, dragging this bubble across. Now you can see we formed a bubble right across the top of the bowl. And it's getting larger and larger, being the pressure increasing inside from the gas that's coming up. Eventually it'll pop and should spill right over the top. So let's check that out. You can actually get these things pretty big too, uh, if, you, if you dare, so to speak. So here we go. It's already kind of outgrown it completely. It's so tempting to actually just pop it right now, but I'm kind of curious how big it's going to get. Now this is not going to make a mess as far as, as far as the bubble part of it goes because what it's filled with is gas. So as soon as it pops, it's going to spill over. The water and everything is still in the bottom uh, there. So here we have almost like a little brain. You know, let's see how big we can go. And there it goes. And it just spills right off, off of the top. Now that was actually cool enough where we're going to do that again. So we just go from here, drag it across create the film. Now one tip I can give you when you're doing this, because it took me a few times to actually get this to work, do not fill the water level all the way up in this bowl because it's bubbling so much inside it pops the bubble. You want it about halfway or maybe less and then the, the bubbling that you hear is not impacting, you know, it's not hitting the actual bubble on the top. So there you go and again it's so tempting just to go ahead and, and pop that guy but we're gonna let it go one more time. I wish there was a way I could just blow it and have it float off, but obviously one thing that you know I didn't point out that's very important for you to understand is when we were blowing the small bubbles, notice how the small bubbles were sinking. The small bubbles didn't float away, they sink. And that is because carbon dioxide is heavier than air. It's more dense than air. Now there's a couple things we want to talk about to understand the science here. We talked about dry ice, it's frozen carbon dioxide gas. Really cold, really dangerous if you touch it with your hands, so you never ever want to do that. When you put it in water, it starts to release carbon dioxide gas, which is really cold. That cold carbon dioxide gas starts condensing the water vapor, and that's the cloud that you see. You know, you can wash it away, flip it away with your hands and sort of see the vigorous bubbling here. Uh, but the cloud you see is actually the water vapor, the carbon dioxide is invisible. Now if you remember, when we were blowing our carbon dioxide bubbles, there's a science lesson in here because you're filling it with that carbon dioxide gas along with water vapor. Now carbon dioxide is heavier than air, it's more dense than air, so carbon dioxide is going to tend to sink instead of float. So a regular bubble, when you blow a bubble, it floats away, right? Well, uh, with a carbon dioxide bubble or a dry ice bubble, it's actually heavier than air. And that's why all of those little bubbles, after they kind of detached, they kind of just sat there. They didn't float away because inside that bubble was a gas that was heavier than air. And that's kind of what happens here as well. You notice all of the carbon dioxide is kind of staying inside of this bowl. And if I flick some of it out like this, it kind of runs over the edge and hits the table and it kind of just hugs the ground as it goes. And that's because it's heavier than air and it wants to go down like that. So the water vapor with the carbon dioxide wants to go ahead and follow that path. So I'm Jason with scienceandmath.com. I hope you've enjoyed this experiment. Go get the materials, go have fun with it, use some common sense, and learn about dry ice and blowing dry ice bubbles.